Hello, and welcome to What is Innovation? The podcast that explores the reality of a word that is in danger of losing its meaning altogether. This podcast is produced by Outlast Consulting, LLC, a boutique consultancy that helps companies use innovation principles to solve their toughest business problems. I'm your host, Jared Simmons, and I'm so excited to have Kapil Kane. Kapil Kane is Director of Innovation at Intel China, where he co-founded and runs GrowthX, an award-winning corporate innovation accelerator. Over the past 20 years, he has helped design and launch world-class products and businesses at the intersection of arts, design, and technology. Creator of the first multi-touch screen at Apple, Kapil went on to lead product design on iPod, MacBook, MacBook Air, iMac, and eventually the iPad. Kapil has deep expertise in areas of technology, innovation, and entrepreneurship through advising startups and engaging with leading accelerators, universities, and NGOs around the world, as well as speaking at large global conferences. Born and brought up in the tiny seaside province of Goa, Kapil completed his bachelor's degree in India and went on to receive a master's in engineering from Stanford University, eventually finding his way back to Asia in Shanghai, where he has been living with his family for the past 15 years. Kapil. I am so excited to have you on the show today. Thank you so much for agreeing to join us. And thanks for having me. I think it's going to be a fun conversation based on the, the, the little, you know, 10-minute conversation we had before. I agree. I agree. I can't wait to dive in. So why don't we get right to it? To your mind, what is innovation? Innovation is very simple. It is taking an idea and putting that idea into action. It's not about idea itself. It's what you do with that idea that matters the most. Mm. And as they say, ideas are a dime a dozen, right? And it's uh, uh, what you do with it. So uh, I think that I think is, is the most important thing I call innovation. And if you think of an idea, you know, it doesn't have to be a scientific breakthrough that you're starting with. Mm-hmm. It could be something that exists today. You find a new way of using that idea in a new let's say like a vertical or taking something that exists in one place and putting it in a different place Mm -hmm. and doing it in a way that brings value to the users, to the customers or to the society. And that's innovation. It's more to do with how you execute rather than how cool your idea was or what was the origin of your idea. Mm. Well said. I couldn't agree more. The idea is being a dime a dozen sort of concept. It feels like that's what gets the attention, you know, is the idea. By the time you see something out in the market or see it anywhere outside of someone's head, a lot of execution and a lot of work has happened to get it there. Mm, Yeah. And I think that's probably, to your point, that's such a big part of what we consider innovation. Yeah. And other thing is a lot of times when the idea is in the market, when someone sees it, they were like, ah, that's nothing. We had the same idea three years ago. Right. So I'm like, that doesn't count. What did you do with it? (laughs) You only talked about it and they actually made a product. So. Yeah. So that's why, you know, what they did is cooler than, you know, just what you're doing, which is simply talking about it. And it doesn't matter who came up with the idea first. It's who actually draws the value out of it first Mm. or or who draws the most value out of it. Right. Right. Yes. So as people talk about innovation, the action or execution piece of it doesn't float to the top very often in the conversation. What are some of the other things you see people focusing on or talking about outside of the execution piece? One of my uh, thing is, is that a lot of times when people think of innovation, they think it's some sort of like a moonshot or mm. some kind of something grand. Mm-hmm. And if it's a small increment, not, I wouldn't say increment, let's say an adjacent kind of innovation that is, you take something that exists, add like, you know, a piece of software or a firmware or find a new market for it. And maybe you make millions and millions of dollars, but people would not think of it in the same way as you bring something totally new, but useless out in the market. That's another (laughs) pet peeve I have is how shiny the thing is. And people judge your innovation by that. And which is like a wrong way of looking at innovation. And a lot of times innovations are sometimes some innovations that don't look that shiny, don't look that sexy are the ones that really really matter and really bring value to your end users or your customers. And so that's another pet peeve I have Mm. about innovation is that people kind of dismiss it because it's not like a breakthrough in science or engineering right? or maybe some creative. Yeah. 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 The kind of separation between innovation and invention. 
Mm. Like an invention isn't necessarily an innovation. You know, it could be, like you said, I love that phrase, new but useless. Mm. That's not innovation. You might have invented something, but it's not necessarily innovative. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes inventions take time mm -hmm. to turn them into innovations because a lot of times the time for that invention has not come. Mm. So I think you need to keep iterating on it. You need to keep going back into, you know, your, you know, inventions to see if anything worth, you know, trying again, maybe after five years. So I think there is value in invention. Absolutely. But like, you know, one should not confuse invention with innovation. Yeah, yeah. That's a great point about invention plus time could equal innovation. You know, if you let it sort of wait for its moment in this cycle of human history, you know, you look at things that suddenly take on a whole new definition or a whole new usage hmm. just because we've kind of caught up with what we could do with it. Yeah. And the classic example of this is the post-it notes, right? Hmm. So it was an invention. They were trying to, you know, guy was trying to create like some glue, which is very strong and ended up creating a easily removable glue. He didn't know what to do. So he just filed it. And five to 10, I think it was 10 years later, the guy, you know, found that. Right. And he built the post-it notes because he was trying to solve a problem of how to stick notes to his, I think notes they used to play, you know, like violin and stuff like that. Mm. And he wanted something to stick there, but not stick permanently. And he remembered that this, the glue that was created as an accident and post-it was born. Wow. So that's a classic example. Yeah. No, that's a perfect example. And it, it illustrates the point you were making quite well. I think the other element that comes out of that, I think it's sort of the adjacencies. Mm. You may build something for a specific purpose, but being able to look at it in sort of its elemental form and say, okay, well, I, I designed this to do X, mm. but what its fundamental function is, it sticks things together temporarily. So being able to see those things at their fundamental level lets you see the adjacencies and the other potential applications that might come out of it. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Over the course of your career, you mentioned people looking at ideas as being or focusing less on action, more on the idea itself. Mm. I also heard in what you were saying a little bit about people looking at the big innovations or the big outcomes uh, more than the smaller outcomes. Mm. How have you seen sort of small victories in your career. Can you think of any examples of uh, something that was innovative that came to life and other people might see it as a small thing, but kind of opened the door to a lot of other, other things? I, I can give you an example of one of the projects from the, the accelerator that I co-founded at Intel. Mm -hmm. The accelerator is called GrowthX. And the idea here is that what we wanted to do is commercialize innovations that happen in the labs. So you know, most of our employees are engineers. They like to tinker in the lab, build things, build cool demos, tech. Mm -hmm. And the, the question I had was, how do we find a way to commercialize this thing? So I built a, a accelerator where we take a batch, like, you know, we batch of cohort and we give them all the skills and just like in any startup accelerator, but instead of external startups, these are internal startups. Mm -hmm. And so we were like, you know, like doing batch by batch. We did two batches a year. And I think the third, it was the third batch is when we had the very first success case, hmm. which is we are able to land something in the market from the ideas that came from our employees. What happened is this small team, and this was at a time when this Amazon Echo, like the smart speaker market was just picking up. Sure. And the sales of like a desktop PCs were going down. Mm -hmm. And so this guy came up with an idea saying, you know, hey, what if we combine the functionality of speaker and we can take this functionality and put it in our desktop. And then it may be, it may make the sales of desktop go higher, you know, or stop the decline in the sales. Mm, right. Yeah. So typically we would have just gone and we would have just implemented as a feature, but here we really went back to like the drawing board, looking at the business model, looking at the value proposition. And we found out from like focus groups, from talking to the customers that there is no such need mm -hmm. and that we should instead build a smart speaker from the ground up for the Chinese market. Because at that time, there was no such smart speaker in, in China. Uh -huh. And there are different things. Like, for example, the Chinese language, national language processing is different. You need to have different kinds of integration into the product. You can't just take the same 
like let's say Amazon's design and, and put it in China. Right. And so we thought that was the right way to do it. And yeah, we started doing uh, like, you know, building that reference design. And then we were able to get JD.com, which is like Amazon of China mm -hmm. to pick up that as become our customer right. to go to market with that product. And so that was a very first kind of a success, which, you know, people might say, ah, what's the big deal? This is like a similar to the Amazon one, but we actually opened up a smart speaker market for China. And it also made us realize that we need to go like customer inspired, customer centric way. We need to embrace lean startup methodology. Yeah, That was the very first like market lending. And now we have like close to 20 or since then. Wow. So that was kind of a trigger point for us to question everything. It's not just, you can't just put more money to these innovations and expect them to get to the market. You really need to question what you're building, why you're building and build MVPs, test them with the customers and keep iterating until you are sure that you have a product market fit. And then we use that at the very core in what we do now in, in our accelerator. So uh, yeah, that's like, you know, I would say like a small success that yeah. opened a door for like many, many successes to come. Yeah. Mm. Oh, that's a great example because it's not just about the the outcome in the market, but it also established a blueprint for what the key elements hmm. are for a an in-market innovation and how to take a technical invention. What do you need to add to that to turn it into an in-market innovation and getting to those insights in a way that is contextual and not sort of biased toward the initial idea of how it might work? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I remember another project, which is, you know, in, in the, I think the follow, another following batch. And this is, we had created a really cool concept. We call it PC farm. So a personal computer, right? If you look at the desktop inside that, there's a motherboard. Right. And the shape of the motherboard is custom to what the desktop, you know, PC is like, right? It's like a little tower. Mm -hmm. And now what this idea here, the guy came with the idea is what if we take that motherboard and turn it into a form factor of a server and we create a server rack and we put it in the back room of your office and it still connects one-to-one -one with your uh, monitor and keyboard and the mouse. So your office desks are very clean, mm. just monitor, keyboard and mouse and all the, the PC is sitting in the back and there's a like, you know, cabling. Yeah. And what it does is it keeps the environment clean it's easy to upgrade. So for example, you can easily swap the motherboard for the next upgrade. Second is security as well. You, you can't take your USB stick and poke anywhere. You just come to the office, you do your work, you go home. There's nothing to fool around there, right? right. And, and so they, they had one use case in mind is VR cinemas. Because at that time, I think it was like four years ago, VR cinemas were picking up in China. That means you would go to a cinema and put on your VR glasses. Yeah. And there, there would be this PC under your seat. And what would happen is after a while, the fan would come on and it would start whirring and, and the seat would start vibrating. <laughs> and so they wanted to solve that use case with this PC farm is they put all your PC back room. So your, your and seat is not hot either, right? And so that is... In our old way, we would be like, yay, let's just do it. Let's build it and let's sell it. And we quickly realized that, you know, the VR market was not going to take off anytime soon. And it is true now. We don't have any VR cinemas here, but we found an application of this in internet cafes for game streaming. So ah. you are locally caching the game. So the internet cafes, they found this idea very good because now internet cafes are not cluttered. They have like very clean desks. People cannot put drives. They cannot insert virus or anything. You, people just come and go. And yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So that's also, again, thinking of, you know, looking at not just one market, but look at systematically what could be the other use cases and rank order them, go test those different markets and use this methodology and, and rigorous practice of this customer inspired market inspired innovation into our commercialization, you know, strategy. So yeah, and it has sold as well, but you know, it was the first project that opened uh, the door, you know, for yeah. other followers to come. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that, that's another great example. The job to be done or the problem to be solved was a consumer experience was rooted in a specific consumer experience, but the invention that came from trying to solve that problem actually had a broader use case. So even when the market didn't materialize around that problem, you still had the invention there to be able to kind of 
look back and say, okay, well, what other use cases could there be and directly reapply it? Mm -hmm. Doing the work within that specific job to be done around the VR cinemas, I'm sure it helped with clarity of thought, specificity, and moving towards a finished tool. And so, so that's why even when in, in innovation work, as long as you take a portfolio sort of mindset, mm. something that sort of cuts branches off the tree, it's really useful whether that end product survives or not. Yeah. And I think interesting is well, uh, talk about portfolio, mm -hmm. you know, and we use this portfolio approach in the kinds of ideas we bring into the accelerator as well. Mm -hmm. And what we do is say every year we pick 10 to 12 ideas. We, we make sure, you know, that there are some ideas in there, which we can see clearly landing in the market in like next, uh, you know, 12 to 18 months. Mm -hmm. And then there are some cool ones, but risky ones. And then there are maybe one or two, which are like really inspirational. Right. So that's also something we learned over time is you need those inspiring things as well to get people excited. You need those sure short ones. So you are like, you know, actually delivering value. There's right. a ROI to keep mm -hmm. investing in it. And then in the middle, the ones you can actually really have fun with. So that's also something I think to keep in mind is that portfolio kind of an approach and you can then scale it up as well. Like, you know, to your whole corporate wide mm -hmm. that, you know, you need to have programs that are like moonshots. You need to have programs that are like adjacent innovations and you need, you have your business units that are doing incremental innovation. So I think we need to think of that. It's like innovation is not one size fits all mm -hmm. different kinds of innovations, different levels of innovations. And another thing very interesting is also, it depends on the kind of people you have just because like Google is having this X lab doesn't mean you should start the X lab. Right. Right. Uh, so we realized that, you know, our, Employees in China are very good at customer-inspired innovations, whereas people back in the headquarters in, in Silicon Valley, they are good at fundamental moonshot kind of innovation. And mm. I can't, we have tried, but you cannot get those people to look at customer-inspired and we cannot get our people to do, you know, this uh, moonshot kind. Right. I mean, you can, right. but that's, that's a match, you know? Yeah, it's the longer way around. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a great call out. A big part of how we approach innovation in my firm is from the people first. It's a people-centric innovation approach. Mm. The process is secondary because whatever process, if you want to bring that moonshot process, you decide that's the right process for innovation. If you apply it with your team there in China, it's not going to work. But understanding the people you're dealing with not only the um, personalities or the skill sets, but also the, the lived experience and what they've seen success with, because that informs a lot as well. Hmm. I really like that you're bringing that portfolio view within the accelerator, because what I've seen big companies miss on when they think about portfolios is they silo the teams. So there's a team that does the moonshot work, a team that does the sort of sustaining work, and then a team that does the, you know, the other types of innovations. Mm. And it's not always energizing and fulfilling and uh, inspiring for every type of person on, on those different teams, because they only get to work on that one type of problem. Mm. And then it creates a situation where you have to change teams or change environments to find the type of work that you really are energized by, or you kind of push through and, and do kind of just uh, execute on the work that's in front of you, but it doesn't lead to that sort of, you know, you know this, but innovation work is draining because it's iterative. There's a lot of misses. <laughs> There's a lot of wrong turns and you need energy to be able to push through those things. Mm. So that's why we believe you have to start with, does a person, are they energized by this type of work? Mm. So I'm really excited to hear you have all types of work in the portfolio, uh, in the accelerator. And we, also vet the people before we bring them into the accelerator. So what we do is mm -hmm. after the, the people teams apply, we hold a two-day boot camp. Oh, wow. And this boot camp is supposed to help them turn their idea into a little five-minute pitch that they can pitch to the jury. But during that time, we really assess how these people are. We give them challenges. We, we see if they are willing to pick up the phone and cold call. We see if they're willing to get out of the building and uh, go find the answers. And we see if they're coachable or not. Mm. And that's also a huge factor of whether, you know, we can bring them into the accelerator or not. And what we are seeing is the more senior you are, the less coachable you become. So that's also something we have learned. 
Yes. Yeah. So some people are surprised, you know, how, yeah. how can this guy, you know, he's a principal engineer, how come his idea did not get in? And we're like, you know, there are so many factors. It's like, can we really help them or not? That's in the end, you know, what determines yeah. acceleration, right? Yeah. yeah. Not your credentials. Oh man, that's amazing. That's fantastic. You can assess individual, you can assess the team and you can assess their sort of collaborative skill set, their ability to work with others. Mm. I'm sure that dramatically increases the quality of the outcomes within the accelerator. So we've talked about what innovation is. What isn't innovation? Ah, it's a pet peeve of mine, you know, is, uh, let's say, parading startups on a stage in front of uh, investors is definitely not innovation. <laughs> Creating like a so-called innovation center with foosballs and coffee and beer is also not innovation. And <laughs> these are like the two things, yes. <laughs> you know, I, I, I call them like, you know, I'm not me. It's a, it's a very well-known like a thing called innovation theater. Right. Yeah. And I see a lot of theater happening. Mm. And so, yeah, so I think, you know, that's something I always like to point out that, I mean, you can do all of this as long as you know why you're doing it and you're doing it for the right reasons. Right. So just working with startup doesn't make you innovative. Right. No, that's well said. It's the icing. It's not the cake. Yeah. 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 I'm so glad you highlighted those two things because it's really hard to break that connection in the minds of people who are looking at the innovation industry, so to speak, from the outside looking in. Mm. If you ask a person on the street to describe innovation or what an innovative process or what process of innovation is, they would probably talk about those things. Mm. You do TED Talks or you have 50 companies come in and they pitch and then you do this thing and all that stuff. Mm. And it's kind of taken on a, a life of its own as mm. this is what innovation is and what it looks like. Yep. And companies are easily bought into, oh, well, if I buy a building over here and throw some foosball tables in it, a keg, kegerator, then I should get my billion dollar moonshot idea in about six to 12 months. <laughs> you know? yeah. And that's just not how it works. Yeah. But, but, you know, real innovation, right. Even like people think of this VCs uh, uh, like, you know, they've discovered new uh, startups to invest in. Mm -hmm. It's very hard work. It's backbreaking work, you know, especially the VCs, let's say in China, you know, like let's say uh, GGV or something, mm -hmm. they have to, travel to like remote places they need to talk to so many people to find those diamonds in the rough you know it's because they have some cool lobby and and the founders come in seeking you know like <laughs> money right this guy had to go out and discover so i think that's one thing is, uh, is missing and a lot of times especially you know from people in like you know the government and you know those kind of they ask me where is your innovation center i want to come visit or even other corporates mm. and i tell them I have no innovation center. Innovation happens everywhere in our company. It's, there is no <laughs> one place to go to do innovation. It happens at all levels. <laughs> oh, that is so great. Every, everyone needs to hear that. Yeah. yeah, that's the mindset. We need more innovation. Okay, let's create an innovation center. Mm. Let's take this group of people. Let's separate them from everyone else. And let's put them in this building. And mm. they'll do the innovation work. And we can all keep doing, <laughs> I don't know. I don't even know what other kind of work there is. But apparently people think there's something other than innovation. <laughs> in my mind, if you're not innovating, you're, you're falling behind. Mm. You're, work, you know, you're doing yesterday's work. Yeah. And no company can survive with any employee doing yesterday's work. And it's uh, funny, you know, like talking about this innovation, I think I worked at Apple around nine years, close to 10. Yeah. And none of us use this word innovation, never, ever. <laughs> and it became popular, I think, you know, around six, seven years ago, where mm -hmm. everyone's talking about innovation and asking about your innovation strategy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, it's like, it's everyone's job to do innovation. You don't need a special title for it and you don't need a special function. It's a skill. Innovation is a skill. Yeah, that's right. Well said. I'm sure that'll be shocking to people to think that the word innovation isn't spoken in every single meeting at Apple, right? You, you just assume everybody's walking around talking about innovation. Yeah, never, never. You know, I, I, I very, very clearly remember, like, you know, I used to write a lot of emails, especially when I moved to China, I would have to send back daily reports to my management of what happened here in China that day. And never, ever, I remember typing, like, there is this innovation. We just talk like subject matter, you know, like, this something is wrong. This is how we fix the problem. We need to change the design there or something. We need to like do like a design of experiment on this. But we never talked about like, you know, oh, there is this new innovation happening or, you know, yeah. 
So. Yeah. And I, I wish I could recall the person who said this, but the, the, um, I'm a musician. I grew up playing music before I was an engineer, before I was anything else. Mm. So a lot of things I relate back to music, but there's a, I can't think of who it was. It may have been Miles Davis said that there's only two kinds of music, good and bad. Mm. And I feel like when you've mastered a space, you know, and can see it on that fundamental level, then you don't talk about it anymore. Mm. You know, so he's not talking about jazz. He's talking about music Mm. and Apple because it's part of the DNA of the company and it's seen and sought out as a skill, you don't have to talk about it. You know, mm. you're just talking mm. about how do we make our products better for our customers and our, and our and, and users. Mm. So, you know, that's how, you know, you have an innovative culture. If you're making new, new or better products and you're not talking about innovation. Yeah. That's a really, really great insight. Thank you for sharing that. So do you have any advice for innovators? Absolutely, you know, and the first thing is don't be just an opportunist in what you create, right? Mm. Create things for the right reason, create things because you deeply feel something needs to be fixed. Then if you have that real connection to what you're doing, you'll be able to sustain when the things get really bad. Right. If you're in it just to make money or you're jumping on a bandwagon, then you know, yeah, you will just quit at the when when the things go start getting difficult at the first instance, you'll be gone. So that's one general advice. And I see it happen a lot, like these days, like especially people jumping onto AI, crypto, you know, like metaverse, Mm -hmm. NFT, people Mm -hmm. like, you know, come out of the woodworks and just start throwing out all these jargons. And they're just simply creating a lot of noise. Uh, So that's one thing I'll say, you know, in the end, I think keep it very simple, have a real vision, have a real purpose in what you do can be very small, even as small as making the best in a coffee press. Mm -hmm. One of our, like, you know, product designers at Apple, he moved to Japan many years ago, like maybe 15, 20 years, 15 years ago. And all he does is he builds beautiful coffee presses. That's his passion. Amazing. Other kind of advice is, you know, like more operational, like if you're a techie, Mm -hmm. then just go beyond tech and learn more about business, learn about like, you know, articulate your idea because no matter how great your technology is you need to be able to sell that so true and for the people on the other side you know who are very much business focused uh, is just scratch you know beneath the surface of different like technologies that are around like even crypto just try to understand what it is what is blockchain you don't need to be an expert but i would say like just increase your like you know bread so those are the two more operational and like more practical advice and the first one is like you know really find your purpose and don't just jump onto the bandwagons and don't like look for the shiny thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. That is a, that's great advice for all of us. And I know I'm going to take a lot away from that myself. So uh, I appreciate you sharing that. Kapil, thank you so much for your time. And thanks for joining me on the show today. Any other thoughts or anything you wanted to talk about? Mm. I think just to continue on that, you know, is uh, I would say best innovations happen at the intersection of different functions. You know, like I think there was a famous picture, I think at Steve Jobs, I think, you know, like, I don't know which keynote, maybe it was a release of iPhone, which was like, there was this, uh, the intersection Mm -hmm. and which said like, I think like, you know, science and humanities. Mm -hmm. So that's where real innovation happens when you apply science to general normal problems of of our humanity. It comes from a passion of improving something or making in our human condition better. And a lot of, you know, like a scientific innovations also happen because, you know, you're looking to solve some some challenge. Mm. And it could also be the other way around, right? Like, you know, you're, you're working on something really highly scientific and then it applies to, applies when a, a problem presents itself. So I think there's no one way uh, of innovating, there's multiple ways of coming to that intersection and yeah. everyone has their role to play. Yeah. And that fits right in with your advice and the, you know, the examples we were talking about in terms of with the intersectionality of, you know, like you said, science and humanities. We've been doing this podcast for a while and almost every guest I talk to has some sort of hobby, you know, mm. you know, one guy was a skin diver. There've been people with all kinds of hobbies and the way you 
do and engage with your hobbies is the way you engage with this type of innovation work is what I've found. Mm. And I think it's because of what you just described, the intersectionality. These are the things I think deeply about and care deeply about. And when I find something in the business context that I can also apply my passion and purpose to, I'm going to approach it uh, in a similar way. Yeah. Always keep learning. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's, uh, it's, that's so critical. So critical. Well, I really appreciate you joining us today and look forward to uh, staying connected. And thanks again for making the time to join us on the show. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jared, for having me. It was fun. All right. Take care. We'd love to hear your thoughts about this week's show. You can drop us a line on Twitter at Outlast LLC, O-U-T-L-A-S-T LLC, or follow us on LinkedIn where we're Outlast Consulting. Until next time, keep innovating, whatever that means.